Testing. Yeah, go. Yeah, we're live. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to another episode of Glass House. Um, we're doing another open call. So um, this time we've got Silas, uh, Runa is joining us. Uh, Jags is here. We've got Dave. Um, JD might be joining us later, depending on uh, whether he makes it or not. Um, before we start, I'd like to remind everyone that the opinions expressed are the opinions of the individual and do not represent the opinions of their employer or Glasshouse. You nailed it. Boom. All right. That's it. We're done. No more chatting. Okay. So um, to start out, we've got a few cyber things that have happened that we could talk about. Um, so one issue is a discussion of whether the Olympics are going to be hacked by Russia. Um, there's reasons to go either way. Um, there's the uh, NSO Kandiru kerfluffle, which is going on right now. Um, there's some funny stuff from the NCSC, tweeting pictures of hackers. And um, we can talk about the uh, implications of NSA targeting uh, individuals in Russia, for example, doing offensive operations against ransomware. Um, so those are those are some starting topics. No way. Wait, hold um, on. Wait. Oh my god. <laughs> we we have John Holquist wow. joining us, which is completely unexpected and amazing. Yeah, John will have to turn on his camera, though. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Good morning, John. Hey! hey. Wow. Welcome. Look at that. I have got a haircut and a beard trim for y'all. <laughs> you you look great. sending gifts. Oh, 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 hold on, though. Hold on. He's got something on oh. the floor behind him, though. Like, this is this is not going to go over well in the, the evaluation of, uh, of your backdrop. <laughs> We got the tin tin. My wife got the tin tin. It was all her. She did all. She staged the whole thing. This is great. All right. So we we've got a full house. So joining us is Don Holquist and JD has showed up. So again, just the like the options of things to talk about: the Olympics and the Russians, uh, ransomware, like individuals being targeted by NSA. Good idea or bad idea? NSO and Kandiro, what is a cyber weapon and why is surveillance software not a cyber weapon? And um, US government's tweeting uh, pictures of hackers. So, Dave, you always have opinions. Nope. Sorry, why are we hitting the, the, the Olympics only with the Russians, man? I mean, you know. Because COVID's already done its its best. <laughs> we started a discussion last Friday. Started over Twitter, and we were debating the prospect of uh, Russian action against the the most recent Olympics. And um, one of the reasons why we invited John to continue that conversation today uh, is we started it down a pretty interesting line of um, analytic argument and. I think it's instructive about how we think about problems, about how we think about adversary benefit, about how we think about denial of adversary benefit. So a lot of things that you know I thought were, were relatively interesting and um, timely for the, the moment. Yeah, good point. All right, so I, I will start out because John is going to be wrong. I just come out and- <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I put forward that the assumption that the Russians will target the Olympics just because they targeted the Olympics last time is a bad, like that's not good intelligence work. Saying like, this is a thing that they did in the past, therefore they will do this thing again in the future. Like it's not necessarily the way that nation states act when they're um, like targeting international sporting events. But I do not think that that's valid. But I, I want to point out, let, let me make my case real quick. It and, and I don't think it's the direct was great, did a great job of, of trolling me about this, by the way. I don't think it's a slam dunk, right? Like, I don't think it's necessary. Well, I mean, if you're going to say it's fucking inevitable, then you should back that up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a slam dunk. I don't think it's inevitable. I do think 
if I were like the security team, this would be my number one concern. Um, and I think, I still think there's an even chance that they go after it, but there's two pieces of evidence. One is of course the historic, the historic piece where they did it last time in Pyeongchang. But the second piece is, is that we know they were going after Tokyo pre, and this is pre COVID, right? So circumstances change, but they were definitely, uh, probing Tokyo. Um, I, I can tell you guys that they were, they were doing almost exactly the same thing they did in Pyeongchang. So, um, but that's stuff that I'm Billy spin that back about. on you. I just want to like put that back on you. If you were the head of a cyber unit for the Russians and you did not probe the Olympics, yeah, yeah. do you think you would get fired or not? <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I, I mean, I think that's, that's perfectly, uh, a perfectly reasonable question to ask. Um, I have another I question. Saying, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a strong signal that they're doing probing. That's all. Is, I mean, do the Russians have a limit that we've discovered in terms of their operational tempo? Because they seem very busy, right? Like, you know, with all the stuff they're doing over here. So I, is, is it possible that they would take a major operation like this just off the table because they already have stuff to do? Or is it literally unlimited? Well, we, the groups that you're talking about referring to over here are SVR. So this would be the GRU. So it's a whole other crew who, by the way, we haven't seen uh, as as busy as they did. And maybe that's like the answer, right? Maybe they just have been like uh, set aside or put on other projects or I don't know. I mean, in all training, fairness, they're doing training. <laughs> In all fairness, they could also just be trying to manage their Kubernetes clusters yeah. because like, because <laughs> shout out to everyone out there who has managed. <laughs> yeah, like, like I, I'm, I'm still trying to get mine off the ground. And to everyone out there who's got a Kubernetes cluster that's working and they build from themselves, like, like shout out to you on that. Mm. Well, uh, and they're all like Kubernetes training and don't have, uh, when you think about the capacity, you think about one, they've been building up that capacity over time. Um, they're employing it in rather more elegant ways to increase reach through automation, to increase efficiency, efficacy of the operations. They're growing away from the highly manual, highly intensive processes we saw even back when, um, I mean, call, call it 2010, 2011, right? We've seen a consistent curve. So that capacity question isn't a fixed point. It's a moving curve and it's against relative priority. Um, the priority that they've received from their political leadership also plays in, um, it's, there may be a bit of hedging in terms of operational capacity in the recon, which is a great point. You know, does one begin to uh, prepare for a cycle if you know that that order may still come down? Um, this also comes back to the halt in the recon, the, the period where we, we ceased to see that activity. Um, one of the conversations is not that they abandoned the mission, but that they did not know what the state of the Olympics would be in Tokyo, because the leadership of the International Olympics Committee and a series of other key officials in Japan had not made those decisions yet. Therefore, they didn't have con ops yet. Having like reducing the uncertainty on what the IOC is going to do is literally the mission of the SVR. And the fact that they did not do that shows that the fucking analysis that they're doing on their cybers is purely operational and not fucking uh, well, espionage collective. Let, let's, let's make a distinction here though. I mean, I, I would be surprised if, you know, China and other countries weren't involved in, in spying on the Olympics. I think the, the big yeah. thing that Sure. Um, you know, we saw last time was this was done for effect. It was a, you know, it was a wiper. It was meant to, you know, just generally shut down the operations of, of what was happening in the Olympics. And to some extent, you know, it disrupted things. It wasn't, uh, you know, catastrophic failure, but it, it was meant for effect and it was done under the guise of another country. And, right? the, and the nature of the targeting we saw, guys, just, just between us chickens, is they were going after critical infrastructure in Tokyo. Like all of a sudden they took an interest in like, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles, right? They were, which by the way, they'd also done in Pyeongchang, which didn't receive as much interest, but you know, like that takes us out of like collection territory into, you know, pre preparation for disruption sort of territory. 
Well, especially if there had been large crowds moving in Tokyo, the, the prospect of that disruption would receive a lot more attention than losing some media broadcast streams. Um, and that would be much more embarrassing to the government of Japan because um, famously, the thing that the Japanese transport system is uh, very good at is that efficiency and that um, exceptional quality um, to, to damage national prestige. And this comes back to the question of what benefit does the Russian leadership see in these ops? Even if they're not present, even if there's not a large international attention in the same way, damaging the prestige of anyone else involved in it still has value because it's blackening the event for everyone that is bringing everyone back down to the level that they've already suffered. So, I mean, like, I, I don't disagree that there's value in it. I just think that they're, like, when they do their analysis and they're weighing up, like, is it worth it? They're going to be looking at the fact that uh, these Olympics are basically, like, naff. They're pretty horrible. Like, no one's there. It's had, like, a huge amount of uh, controversy over who's attending and who isn't. Um, it's deeply, deeply, deeply unpopular inside Japan. And simply letting it go as is would make it something of a, um, it's gonna be like a bit of a black eye for Japan as is. If they just leave it alone, this is gonna be like the sad and embarrassing Olympics. If what Russia you... comes in and like kicks them a bit, everyone's gonna feel sorry for Japan that like not only do they have COVID and like a shitty Olympics, they get fucked by the Russians. Wouldn't like, disruption just be it's... like messing with the stream at that point? Like, isn't isn't right. all they have to do? I mean, just like, isn't that the isn't that the the ultimate like game? And by the way, if if you are highly limited to spectator uh, availability, right, and you take down the stream, does it even exist? I mean, that's actually, a, in my view, a magnified <laughs> effect. It's like um, a tree falls in wood. Intense. Yeah. Sorry, Rune is like laughing. The, you, have, you have a thought? I want to make sure we don't overlook you in our usual yeah. rapid paced exchange. <laughs> so please feel free to jump in aggressively. Yeah. Join in. That's what we do. I have a question, and it's um, Is it possible the Japanese will surprise us with their adeptness at defense? No. Like it, is that <laughs> not a possibility? No. Way. No. Not a chance. <laughs> no. I'd love to believe that. I'd love our partners <laughs> to demonstrate uh, a quality and seriousness to this mission that um, that would put everyone else to shame. That would be wonderful. But but yeah, here's the why, thing, right? Why it, not? So a lot of a lot of you said no. So why not? So uh, what, what's really, what's really bad? That was just like cyber. silence on yeah. the air. Go on, yeah, Greg. I, like they're just terrible. I, He's putting I do it know simply. that there's like there are there's I think an effort uh, around around uh, defense here. So um, I, 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 people are thinking about it like on a, on a global on a global basis. So um, there's some backup going on, which which is, is somewhat reassuring. Yeah, we, we don't have to disparage Japan in particular. I mean, the South Koreans were incredibly aware of the threat. They're used to getting pummeled by North Korea on everything. Um, they were as prepared as you might have, well, they thought they were as prepared as you might have hoped. They, you know, had roped in some folks that maybe weren't the best people to do some of the security. Uh, at the end of the day, though, it, it didn't make much of a difference. And this one seems like, you know, once we start discussing this as essentially a remote Olympics, uh, this is an even juicier, easier targeting. Like, uh, you don't need yeah, to and, go major disruption route. And there's there's other things that come up as well, right? So, well, like, one of them is right now they'd be exposed to just a DDoS, right? If they're doing only streaming and it's, you know, coming out of a, a few stadiums, you can DDoS the entire city and take the city offline. Like, so that is a thing that is feasible. To the London so, Olympics, and um, I, that's a one scenario I'm actually a little more confident that there is a relatively better state of um, mitigation and state of defensive preparation, because we've been dealing with that multiple iterations uh, in stride, and we've uh, we've effectively uh, I'll never say we've, we've solved that problem, but we we have a, I have a higher degree of confidence in. Um, Actions against simple adversary con ops, such as this, versus some of the other things. And again, my, my skepticism on defense is solely based on 
Um, there is no reduction of vulnerability meaningful across any attack surface we care about. So therefore, um, it's all of the other things on those attack surfaces that matter to me. Yeah. Are, are, so are like there the other thing I would point out is like just, just what's briefly, the... the other thing I point out is if a nation state says I want to fuck that thing, like that thing up, like if you bought enough firewalls is not really the deciding factor on whether they succeed or not. Like when a nation state says we're going to rip that shit up, then like they're putting a lot more resources into that than you can conceivably um, stop. Are, are there any normative limits to what? the Russians will do like you mentioned that they were hitting critical infrastructure in Seoul but like if they literally crash trains in Tokyo I mean the Japanese are a nuclear power on their border with shared in you know like it just seems like a very big step yeah so yeah I, I would be I would be quite a nuclear power disruption right like you know it, if this were a normal event right you know it's a massive complex logistics problem moving tons of people back and forth or whatever you just start disrupting you just start disrupting movement of people around you know events start getting jacked up and you create a ton of chaos i think that's you know this although you know the pandemic is already is already <laughs> just sort of stepped in and taken the lead uh, you know in, in that problem but i think in a normal you know under normal circumstances that's what they were thinking but there still oh. remains a huge difference between deliberate malicious offensive actions and natural frictions and pain from something like a pandemic, as bad as the pandemic has been. Um, knifing someone in the back hurts worse. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. So there was a comment actually in the chat that I wanna to touch on. So somebody, uh, so Blasphemy commented about underestimating how pissed off team RU is at the IOC in general and how important participation is to them and motivation of sheer spite. And I think that's a really critical point to also make sure like they are pissed because they are continue to be suspended from the Olympics. But I think also at the same time, when it comes to what their max capable responses, I think as well, they're not going to, I think there's still going to be a restraint element because the thing is, is if they come and they kick over the sandcastle of the Olympics, like they're going to be pissed. And if it's overtly Russia and it's one of these things where it happens and it, it's, and it, especially if there's like a loss of human life or something as well, that's going to increase the suspension and and just push it longer. Except it right. won't be so, it won't be Russia like last time it was North Korea, right? And and if it if it were me running the op, this time it would be ransomware. Well, this is what I was going to say is I don't think their number one threat is um, like a a nation state that rhymes with Asia deciding. <laughs> to cause problems. I think it's ransomware Russia. guys going, you know how many fucking like Bitcoin we can get if we stop the Olympics? Like that is a, a mint your own money opportunity. And these guys, I think like they, they get sort of made fun of a lot. Like, oh, you know, they're just financially motivated criminals. What do they do? <laughs> and it's like, these dudes have got millions of fucking dollars, like huge amounts of money. They've got access to Ode developers, malware developers, Massive they can, money, yeah. yeah, like they've got a lot of money. They've got a lot of fucking motive. Like if they want to spend a million dollars to take out the Olympics, like that's, you know, Tuesday's profit wiped out. You know, well, like they could, they could do that. But that's much more bringing them into the realm of hostess humanist generics, right? Where we already agree that there's exceptionally problematic uh, international responses to this to draw that much attention and fire would um, almost certainly have repercussions within the underground ecosystem against those operators. Yeah, but the thing is, right? So let, let's assume it's ransomware operators, right? Mostly operating out of Russia. Do you really think Putin's gonna let him get in the way of an outstanding SIGINT operation for intelligence collection for a little bit of money? I mean, what, what's the desired end state? Think about the critical mass of VIPs and heads of states that are gonna be there. Like this is the best SIGINT opportunity since the G6. Is there any so, evidence for deconfliction? Are they actually, like, are they actually showing up given I think, sort of like uh, what's happening? The, the, uh, the, the uh, first lady. The first, first lady showed up. She's traveling. That's yep. interesting. Well, and there are a number of heavily vaccinated senior officials that are fully vaccinated senior officials that heavily will be vaccinated. heavily interested. Right? Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> when you get anything, go, you they've just got get the whole five G reception. And I'll go a step further, right? I would say that while the Russians are certainly going to be a big actor, the primary threat actor here isn't going to be Russia. It's going to be China because they it's have a lot the more collection. Yeah, yeah. For that's... the for the Intel collection, they've got a lot more skin in the game with the yeah. That's uh, lower ping know, times as well. Exclusive economic zones and the rest of it. I think that's that's a really that's a really good point. Well, that and they, I mean, they've been on Japan for longer, and they care about it because it's in their backyard. Yeah. So yeah. this is just sort of like a, a ramp up for them, as opposed to like, oh shit, we better like shift focus. Well, Dave, Dave made a, a good comment about whether you know that there is enough deconfliction between these Russian teams to, um, to decide whether you know, they are going to go exclusively for the SIGINT op or exclusively for the, you know, disruption rah-rah um, op. And to me, more than whether there is the confliction and proper coordination between the groups, what it makes me, um, what it makes me think of is whether they're actually in the same place anymore, right? Like with the, the, the Russian operational stance that we saw back in 2016, 17, et cetera, was one of, you know, being a little nutty and being a little irrational and punching above your weight by surprising folks uh, and trying all these crazy things and seeing what you get away with. Um, and we uh, are clearly not in the same place anymore, right? Like uh, APT 28 is essentially, I won't say disbanded, but definitely drastically changed. Um, APT 29 is God knows what now. We're talking about Nobelium and, and these different types of ops. Uh, nobody's talking about Turla, though they're obviously still around. I'm just saying like things have obviously changed for these Russian groups. Um, and our APTs are, are growing up. <laughs> they're leaving well, the nest. Turla, Turla will <laughs> always be below, by, they, love to, they love to hide, man. They don't, they're not flashy. They love no, it. they're there and they're doing their job and they are continuing their SIG admission uninterrupted. Uh, but my point is, right, the, the kids have grown up uh, <laughs> mostly based on the, the force of what happened over those years and some of the response. Um, so are they even in the same place? It is, mm -hmm. you know, given that Holquist is here, is the sandworm of today one that would do a Ukraine blackout again? Is Olympic destroyer of today one that would, you know, do a wide Olympic disruption operation that way anymore? I I don't think, I think that they, you you would have to ask like one of the questions, and, and I we don't really I guess we don't really know. I mean, I, unless you're like reading the intercepts, uh, but you know, one of the questions I would ask is like, was did they have a reason to stop behaving that way? And I, I would say. No, I don't think we've put significant enough significant pressure on them to make them, st you know, stop it. And two, what is their own? What was their own assessment of the success of their operations? And personally, I would say they were incredibly successful, incredibly successful. Uh, when you look for a handful question. of operators to, to 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 have a lasting effect that they did on the American psyche for one, not to mention all the other, mm -hmm. you know, targets. Yeah, they just blew it out of the well, water. Yeah, like I, I think one of the reasons we won't see them is they've all gotten medals and been promoted. Like none of those guys are on the line anymore. They're now managing teams. <laughs> when you see the question though of intent, it's not merely the question of the intent of the team and the as we've seen reflected in changing operational capabilities. It's the intent of the leadership. And mm -hmm. at what point that benefit is seen as um, worth it versus when seen as problematic. And to John's point, I, I absolutely agree. I don't think there's been anywhere near enough consequences to change the decision-making in the Kremlin and the inner circle, um, nor among any of the other adversaries that we, we care about. Um, the, the manner in which those capabilities are, that it, sorry, that intent is reflected in capabilities and the uh, changing structure of how those teams work um, that's simply also a, a function of being a little bit personally technically embarrassed, right? You use only the capability you need for the mission until you get called out repeatedly for being lame. And no one wants to be the person that does only the lame thing. And I think we see that in a lot of their individual investment decisions. You see that a bit with the NSA, though, um, in that, like, 
sorry, not, not that they get called out for being lame, but uh, this is the thing that Dave used to say a lot. I, I think it's very apt is that whenever you meet like the NSA or like CIA dudes, they always talk about how lame they are. Like they never big up themselves. <laughs> like, oh boy, I wish we had that sort of capability. Yeah, we suck. And so like, you know, I, I think that if you get tricked into doing more advanced ops than you need to, you kind of fail as well, right? Like th there is value in not showing your hand if you don't need to. And if like your ego makes you operate at a sort of more expensive level than you need to, well, that's a failure. I don't know, man. You brought up you brought up NSA and CIA in this. Um, we're consistently always operating at an expensive, you know, overly fanciful level. And I, I don't think it, that it that's... hinders their operations. I believe. I think no, that they, I, no, it, I, I, it I don't does, think man. that they, that's they, what... they could do a lot more if they were like like. Uh, China doesn't give a shit, and they do fuck tons. Yeah, yeah, but they don't give a shit. It's not that they don't want the that you know that they're safeguarding their investment. They just don't care. And for us, the most lim the, the the greatest impotence of the American cyber machine comes from our lawyers and people who are just like, <laughs> yeah, that's not. You know, we're not going to touch that one. That's not a good idea. It's not because we're like safeguarding our investments. Like, that's really not the issue. And it brings us back to a question of cyber power that like we were talking about like four or five calls ago, which is, yep. you know, if you looked at it from a purely like technical sophistication standpoint, then the US is like this apex predator, it can do whatever it wants. But if you look at it from the restraint side of the house, it's like we are so caught up in this, you know, straitjacket where you're like, does that translate to a real competitive right. cyber power so, when China, so Russia, just, North Korea, Iran can do whatever the hell they want. Yeah. What that just reminded me of is it's like, uh, it's basically like the US is the guy at the bar who has a wife and everyone else is single and it's like, and he's there, he's like, yeah, dudes, I'm gonna go out till 2 a.m. And gets a phone call like, yes, honey, I'm on the way home. All right, guys, I totally would have smashed it, but you know. <laughs> Like he's the only, I'm, like the US is basically the only one that has someone going like, yeah, I don't know about that. Like, shouldn't we be following some rules? So, so a couple of things on that, right? First of all, absolutely agree with with Jags, right? Like, the the biggest restraint to U.S. cyber operations is a political willingness to accept consequences, oh. right? <laughs> it's it's the lawyers, you know. Somebody somewhere along the lines has has allowed lawyers to convince the rest of us that they're decision making authority instead of an advisory authority, <laughs> right? And World War II would have been like. Can I do this? The lawyer says no. Okay, good. Find me a way to be able to do this. Now it's a well. The lawyer <laughs> we says we need a I new can't. lawyer. <laughs> yeah, you don't get me a new lawyer that's going to tell me yes. Right. So that, that's number one. <laughs> yeah. the, the second, the second part is sometimes you want to use the lamest thing possible, and you want everybody to know that you did it because that's messaging, right? That that's the reality. Is what you know. Why take the risk of burning, you know, a super slick zero day if you can just do it with Cobalt Strike and let everybody know that it was you, right? That, that's a message in and of itself. That's why we place carriers off of, you know, the coast of Iran to go, hey, listen, we see you. And where one is that there's, there's a shelf life on, on O days, right? So, you, you know, you get the super slick O day and you spend whatever, $500,000 on it. There's a possibility that due to no operations whatsoever, somebody slicks like Jags finds it and submits a vulnerability report and it gets patched. And now you've never used these, this ODA, right? So there's a cost benefit analysis there of how many times do I wanna use this ODA because every time I use it, there's a chance of it getting caught. But if I don't use it, it may just evaporate. So there's actually a uh, pretty, use pretty pressure. good paper. Yeah. Right. It's like, you know, sooner or later, you know, the NSA goes to Congress and goes, hey, we need, you know, another hundred million dollars. And they're like, what did you do that last hundred million dollars we gave you for developing O-Days? Because we haven't seen any patched. return on our investment. <laughs> well, and that bureaucratic right? it got patched. is much more pronounced in these authoritarian structures where there is a strong desire to be associated with a prominent operation when you're tying larger sums of investment to that. Um, you're, you have the capability, you are acutely aware that it is a stock that has a rapidly declining utility on an unknown future uh, uh, timescale. Um, those decisions become incredibly 
um, how shall we say, focused for certain adversaries because they're not used to playing with things that are costing a tremendous amount of money across their services. And when, they ha when they've begun to try to acquire these from contractors versus organically developed, um, we know, for example, from various uh, industry reporting that the Russian uh, contractors are underpaid for their development and th what they transfer over for use is um, uh, they know the value of it uh, and have tried to impress upon their government uh, end users the value of that. Um, and of course that makes its way up to the bureaucracy. So there, there is really the idea that you don't want to waste these things. And do you think yeah, that's so why like they're more the, willing to just burn of, those things right? Like, I mean, I feel like- I think there's, there's like two things going on with like Russia's there. One of them is that they're willing to use old exploits if they work. Right. If they if they are in a situation where they know that um, it's okay to be caught in like a month as long as they can get their shit done in time, they don't give a fuck about using something that's been burned. So for them, like when a bug dies, it's not actually it, like it doesn't go off the table. It doesn't vanish in a puff of smoke like it does with NSA. Like if they get even the idea that someone's looking at something, they're going to be like, whoa, all right, like time to back off from that. Whereas Russia's just like, oh, well, you know, like better just go fucking hard on that until, you know, patch levels are super high. But the other thing is that um, part, of, part of the way that their procurement system works is that people who make purchases get kickbacks. That's uh, called slicing. Like, so they, they'll allocate slightly more money than they're supposed to spend and they'll get a kickback from the seller. And given how bad their salaries are, that's one of their major sources of income. So if you look at it um, sort of properly, then they're not actually in the position of like maintaining, preserving and coddling these few O-Day. They're in a, like their job is to buy as many O-Day as they can because that's how they get their money. So their incentive is to burn. Like they're actually incentivized to burn their capabilities. Well, this comes back to the question of at what schedule did they already pre-plan to burn capabilities and rotate and replace? Um, because of the uncertainty of disclosure and detection and the other dynamics and bug collisions, um, a good program will anticipate and have a pipeline for these things on a predictable annualized government budget budgeted activity. And we see this very clearly, for example, earlier in APT 29. Um, famously, one of the uh, FireEye folks did a discussion, um, very good bit of analysis. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to challenge the, the the work that went into that. But we're talking about the adversary's reaction to burning tools and burning exploits publicly through detection and disclosure. Um, and unfortunately, it was a great bit of analysis that showed. You know, yes, there was a there was an impact from this. On the other hand, if you map that against a, a Russian budget, um, you can effectively see that it was a matter of a couple weeks change in what was already a pre-scheduled burn plan. Um, which makes it very awkward for all of us because we put a lot of effort into this, chasing these things and trying to tear them down. And we may not have more than a few weeks impact. Now, maybe that few weeks matters operationally, tactically, in some context for some victim. I will not discount that. Um, but, and cumulatively for sure. But well, no, the, the, the paradigm has changed, right? Like you said early on in APT 29, and even what the Grug was bringing up was well substantiated in the back in the day APT 28, where you know, you saw Sophocy as like the famous pest dispenser of O days um, for a bit. That said, in the new, you know, the the Russian kids are grown up paradigm. Like, what O days have you seen them using? You know, there's been discussion of them using O days for some of these VPNs, um, some of some of the you know famous cluster fucks that we've been seeing lately. But we're not. I mean, first of all, I think our collective awareness of what they're doing is is shaky. Um, and then overall, like, okay, Novellium had that Safari zero day that as far as we all know, wasn't very fruitfully used though, who knows? Cause no one has proper telemetry on anything. Apple, um, what zero days are we see? You know, it's not the same situation as before where you saw them just burning O days one after the other, their, their, their means of conducting these ops have changed and it's almost a slap in the face that they don't necessarily need to do very much of that right it's more slick cleverness 
like um, Google has been tracking like an increased number of ODAs being used and they're not Somebody attributing where they come from. Look at the nature of those incidents though. Like the, I think we were talking about two different types of target sets here, right? right. So we're talking well, like about this is what I think is interesting. So. And we're talking about like uh, human or, you know, like on, on against like smaller, you know. Uh, SMEs smaller. and individuals. Individuals, Dissidents. thank you. <laughs> I th and, and I think we're a lot of these yeah. zero days, have they not been associated with uh, activity that are, are really about individual targeting, well, you know, mostly coming it, well, out individuals, of these... Individuals is where you need O-Day because like if you send, like you can absolutely like fish an individual, but if they're anything, like if they're a moderately hard target, then fishing is not going to work. Whereas if you're going after an enterprise, you know, you've got like a yeah, thousand yeah, people to, <laughs> like at least <laughs> one of them is going to work. Thousand options, right? right? Yeah, exactly. Like I mean, well, if you like look Google's, at the, you know, yeah. the, these really baller players, the SVR, the new SVR stuff that we're seeing, they're still doing password spraying. They're still, you know, in, in credential yeah. stuffing. It did still you, works. Did you see that? Um, like the the Dutch intelligence agency, like threw shade at the Russians. And like uh, they were quoted as saying, "Like we don't have to use phishing. We have O'Day." <laughs> like that's literally a quote from a guy in a fucking interview. They're like, "Yeah, what can you tell us about cyber?" He's like, "Well, we have what's called zero day exploits. We do not need to use phishing." Okay, <laughs> but no, no shade at AIVD because I think they're they're you know they're pretty cool. But if you <laughs> if you set them aside. Are zero days in the way that we're seeing them use, which you're right, Brug, the, the increase is insane. It's exponential for this year versus last year. Um, but are O days becoming like the gold Ferrari, like the kind of like overly flashy middle tier group where like we've got a lot of money and we want to be big kids, but we're not quite there. Like, because you see bitter it's APT like with Reach, this right? and like... like yeah, like bitter APTs in there and the North Koreans and all, and then like all the people that have more money than sense and are buying them from Kandiru and NSO. <laughs> like that's what yeah, populates most so of gauche. that sector. Yeah, yeah. So tacky O-Day. <laughs> Look at these schlubs with their fucking O-Day and lime green and Lamborghini. <laughs> A gold-plated chrome sandbox escape, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, on the that's other hand, though, we have a set of money research sense. efforts that have been directed at exceptionally exquisite capabilities, you know, the space shuttle versus the, the Ferrari, right? When we see these fascinating microarchitectural subversion uh, research lines, and we see some things where um, it's not just that the big boys have grown up past the things we traditionally think of O-Days in, you know, OS and client-side apps, because they all still matter, right? No one's going to say they don't. Um, but the highest end of this profession has moved into things that are unimaginable in context even a decade ago. Um, things that, you know, without getting the cryptologic aspects, would have previously been considered no bus and, you know, scary and in the dark. Um, and we're seeing a lot of adversaries, surprising numbers of adversaries, pop out with capabilities um, that were merely theoretical a few years ago. Is it, is it possible they're forced into that because the cloud environment which is relatively a new like part of the sort of terrain. Like, do you think they're planning that in the future when everything is in the cloud, we have to have hypervisor escapes and side channel attacks, otherwise we'll be ineffective? Well, let, let, let's, let, let's separate those two things, right? Like I, I hear JD saying, um, or in, and I won't put words in JD's mouth, but what that speaks to me is, uh, you know, there, there is that, that top, top tier of folks, um, they're, not, they're not even playing with the delivery mechanisms that we're talking about and that are being bought and touted about at all, right? Like when you see an attack uh, using quantum infrastructure, it, it just shows up. Like it, there's, there's no discussion about what the hell happened there because you have no idea. And that's just a whole different tier. When we're talking about the cloud now, um, and you know hypervisors and what the hell's going on in there. Um, I, I think we've got a place. We're in a position where we're just placing a ton of faith in Microsoft and Google and Amazon, because for the that most seem part, like a bad idea. Well, for it, it isn't necessarily as long as the incentives are in the right place, right? Like for the most part, what you're talking about is saying, look, 
they're a competent regent for our security. Um, they have many more engineers. They have a great threat intel team. They'll take care of this. However, like for those of us that have worked in this space, you know that you're never the best starting out. Like nobody just kicks into, let's say the AV market having the best product. You, you kind of iterate and iterate and, and the world kind of kicks back at you a hundred thousand times. And then you decide, okay, well, we should have a, a rollback module and we should have an exploit prevention thing and we should be monitoring this thing and that thing. Um, and I don't think there's been enough of that development on cloud. And even if there had been, we have no yeah. idea if it's there. So yeah, Cloudflare just came out like there, a few hours ago, there was the blog post about a bug in Cloudflare, which since I haven't read it, I can't say anything more about it other than like all of Cloudflare's fucking uh, boxes were vulnerable and you could use it to fucking hit 12% of the internet. And I think one of the things that we've got with cloud stuff going on is we keep having fucking black swan events that we're like, okay, so everyone is completely prepared for like doing stuff on CPUs. And then it's like, oh yeah, Spectre Meltdown show, shows up. And people like that just fucking came out of nowhere or like Roham where again, it comes out of nowhere. So you can get, you know, like Microsoft and uh, Intel and all these other dudes who are really good. Like they're better at securing stuff than I would be if I had to do it because they've got people who will spend all of their time doing it but they're still gonna get fucking blindsided by, you know, like eight dudes getting their PhDs somewhere in the Netherlands. Okay, but- So, the, and well, hold on, just hold on. So I'll, I'll challenge this. Cause the thing is, is where we, <clears throat> the thing is when people are talking about cloud attacks against cloud infrastructure, there's always the discussions of the row hammers, the specters, the meltdowns and all of those other things. And also the hypervisor escaping. But the thing is, is the people, the adversary groups that are capable of those types of attacks and not just like, not just running a script and using it to open place to place, but that can like grok the importance of it and maximize that access. Like those are very, very few and far between attacks. Like those would be the like Aurora like level attacks when we talk about them and when they occur. By and large, especially with a lot of the cloud stuff, the, the tooling is starting to become developed in a very fledgling sense. Like there's some cloud automation, like pen testing tools that are absolutely phenomenal. But the challenge is with them is they are essentially automation bits on top of the existing sysadmin tools for cloud environments. So the thing is, is all of the stuff of like living off the land, like that is the, the hotness of how cloud will be, at least from my belief, is that it's just going to be living off the land things. And there's not going to need to be a like gold plated zero day when there's the, like this leaky API key that just keeps falling on GitHub every week. <laughs> can, can I just add, can I just add something on top of that? Because I, I want it to like, I, I want this conversation to include a whole nother realm of the problem with cloud, which is fine. There's the stuff that you can do as a, you know, this is my cloud instance and I'm going to hire brilliant folks to try to figure out what's going on. Then there's like, what does my cloud provider allow me to see, right? They've got a, a driver or whatever that I can actually, you know, get some sense of what's happening with this cloud instance. Then there's what can the cloud provider security team see that we can't see? And obviously there's a lot of correlation to be done there. And, and that's where you're going to see the hypervisor escapes and all the more sophisticated stuff. But my question is, what incentive do any of these cloud providers have to share the true apex stuff, right? Like, and, and I'm, I'm about to disparage a bunch of companies that I, you know, respect and admire for what they do, but I'm sorry, you know, like Microsoft sees, uh, you know, security as a multi-billion dollar business now. Are they gonna come out and say, hey, there was a hypervisor escape that basically meant all of Azure was at the mercy of, you know, this one country and they stole everything. Sorry guys, we're patching. Or like, you know, does, does Google have any incentive since they're not really in the security business uh, at, at any serious scale, right? Like what we see from TAG is, hey, look at all the cool stuff we found. No details, no attribution, no country, no yeah. group, no O'Day's, nothing. Oday's going after individuals, not after fucking big things that actually matter to Google as a company. Yeah, what right? motivation oh, do yeah, they we have found to it, let uh, you know? Well, security yeah. has always been about PR for those vendors. And I think it's very interesting how much the policy arguments have been captured by those vendors in furtherance of their essentially PR goals. And 
we're patching is realistically to security what thoughts and prayers is to our gun violence problem. And, and it's been true for 20 years and we've made exactly the same amount of progress on security as we have on gun violence. And that's just the way it is. Well, like what, what would be the rule set that would make a sort of like a California regime for security then? I, I've always you know, tried to push like you have a remote mm -hmm. vulnerability that has exposed my company and then I take your product offline for two years and I'm not allowed to use it wherever it was exposed. So if, I don't know, Pulse Secure happens to have a remote vulnerability, then every company that, you know, said, oh, well, I was exposed, you know, you're in the detention box for two years. And if that means I don't renew my contract and I go with a different vendor, then great. So I, it's simple, really. It sounds simple though. I mean, it, it sounds simple and it sounds great, but the reality is that when you're a large corporation, right, there's there's a serious call watching vendors, particularly if it's used for core business functions. But I, I think you have to you, you know, look at and, the big cloud provide. Sorry, you're cutting out a little bit. Oh uh, yeah, my, my connection's not. So the issue is that <laughs> You know, okay, so you you go with Google, right? And it's like, okay, well, they had an issue, so we're going to go with Amazon. They had an issue, and I went to Azure, and now Microsoft had an issue, and now, okay, I'm going to go back to the early 1990s. And I'm going to bring everything in house, right? It's just, Oracle, go back. <laughs> I, Oracle yeah, is its Alibaba. own entity. Yeah, but it's it's like Alibaba. the same thing if you're doing it to yeah, if you're doing it to like VPN boxes, right? Like, there's only so many VPN boxes you can buy until. Like you banned all of them for two years. Well, let's get simpler, right? We're talking right now. We're talking about cloud, which is obviously we're talking essentially about you know rent rent an ecosystem. Um, let let to, to address Dave's point about you know ripping stuff out that that has been vulnerable. What's going to happen with Kaseya VSA, right? Like this week's monster of the <laughs> week, right? You know thoughts and prayers, we're patching, you know, the, nobody could have seen this coming, we're working on it, we're doing it better now, we told people to shut down. Like Kaseya is presumably working their asses off over the past week, and you can, you can be sympathetic, and to some extent you kind of have to be, but realistically, let's say that they were the worst offender. Let's pretend that, they, that they're a company that just didn't give a damn, which I don't think it's the case, but let's pretend that's the case. Do you think that all of these VSA customers are in a position to say, oh, screw this, where is, you know, where's the next one? And like turnkey, we switch from Kaseya VSA to whatever the hell other RMM hasn't been publicly abused yet, right? It seems like I, an unrealistic I mean, expectation. It, maybe, these, these are real efforts, but I mean, what happened to Kaspersky, right? Like they got ripped out of every place that I looked in the financials in the States and every government contract, they were pulled out and it took a couple years. The first it wasn't pulled out because they were a uh, entity that was uh, exploited by other actors. It, there was a much more complicated well, consideration. Well, risk is risk at some <laughs> they point. They were only exploited right? by one actor. <laughs> you guys yeah. think? You guys I know, Runa, we were just in a conversation about this uh, on Twitter and uh, I, I suspect you might not share my views in quite the same way, but. Do you guys think part? that increasing, uh, like, uh, you know, the shrinking market, right, uh, to, to a handful of vendors, you know, is going to increase security because they'll be able to sort of guarantee a higher level of security? Or do you think a variety of vendors who, uh, who have, you know, varying levels of security and not none at all is better for, you know, security ultimately. I think Dan Gear taught us the costs of monopoly, right? Yeah. It, it's funny. So bad. Our, our issue right now is one, if you ask me, our issue is one of incompatibility. Like it, it isn't one, we're not at a danger of a homogenous ecosystem, um, which let's face it, the Dang. conversation... Like, the conversation we're having right now is about largely Windows. Mac OS is a disaster as far as visibility goes, and iOS isn't even worth discussing, and that's on purpose. Apple is keeping us blind. Um, but so what we're talking about is Linux and for the most part, Windows, um, where the cat and mouse game is thriving. 
So at that point, we aren't discussing whether we're at risk of a monoculture in the way that, that Dan Geer warned us um, years ago. Rather- I think he was we're, talking about Windows, dude. Yeah, no, no, I'm saying like within Windows- Like literally, we're, like, and we're now at a situation where Windows is like as ubiquitous as it's ever been. And we're seeing like, the, like WannaCry, that is flat out, like that wouldn't have happened with Linux. Like, first of all, no one would ever be able to get Samba running. But second of all- <laughs> <laughs> but No, it, yeah, come like, on. It, it, it's a different, it's a, what I'm saying is within the Windows ecosystem, if you're talking about agents and antiviruses and, and security telemetry, I don't think we're at a risk of a monoculture. I think the situation that we're in is one of it, just incompatibility between offerings and between telemetry and being unable to really judge whether John's solution or Silas's solution or my solution or Kaspersky or whomever are doing better or worse in what way. Like there's a lot of goodwill, faith, and, and, and you know, thoughts and prayers going into, you know, whether you get one of the high-end solutions or whether your, mar you know, marketing was effective enough to get you to buy random startup X. And the, the false equivalence there is one that's a little scary when you realize, you know, it's not a, mar it's not a sales pitch. It's just when you realize that almost every discussion we have is based on the telemetry that comes from that stuff. And there's no equivalence from there, like right? Like, four did you vendors, see any basically. of it? Right, like if, if it's CrowdStrike, uh, FireEye, uh, Palos, sometimes uh, Sentinel-1, I think, has released some stuff. I mean, like not, not in, at the volume as like the other guys, but in terms of like what we end up talking about, it's basically like the, the marketing and um, PR departments at FireEye have blessed us. That's what we well, discuss. If you're talking about like the 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 release of, of research, yeah, man. I mean, for the most part, most folks are following Absolutely, yeah. these different blogs. Or, you know, if they're lucky, if you have if you're sitting on a bunch of money, you go, you buy CrowdStrike reports, you buy Kaspersky, you buy FireEye, and you've got you're on the lead and you're you know a week or two ahead of everybody else, and you're gonna get a lot more depth of what's going on. Uh, but for the most part, most people are doing what right now? Twitter sock and you know an rss feed of these different blogs and waking up every day in a cold sweat going oh my god you know what's today's absolutely horrendous like industry redefining attack that congress is going to be having a conversation about three weeks from now and it's not going to change nothing right like solar right. winds in itself like come on we, we couldn't even put it to rest and now we're you, talking you about wanna, another you want to feel day. old yeah, solar yeah, winds was this year. <laughs> like solar winds was only a few months ago. <laughs> well, but they, and they pop the up again. It speaks to the absolute tyranny of current firefighting, destroying all of our intelligence processes. The fact that Twitter sock is a more reliable mechanism for anticipating decision maker pain in a given day means our entire warning architectures have fallen over entirely. We are in a place where all of the forward-leaning estimated work that we need to do, all of the orientation of resources are not where they need to be. And again, whether it's because we're all fixated on trolling virus total or we're all <laughs> desperately seeking, seeking some telemetry in a place that uh, we don't have the visibility across the industry, um, you know, this has a cost. And the adversary is, of course, adapting to this because they see the areas either through deliberate study of our ecosystem or through experimentation that produces results that are better operational outcomes and less detections, they will find their way into that, often in ways we don't anticipate. Solar Winds was as much experimentation around a long running stream of enablement ops as anything else. And this is arguably why when we talk about folks like Turla, or more accurately, we ignore folks like Turla for very long periods of time because of the um, manner in which they've been successful in avoiding some of that uh, other higher concentration, uh, higher attention areas of effort. Uh, we run into these challenges. Also, by the way, why do we not have a numbered APT for Terla? Once again, I'll call that out. 
yeah the, the graduation process is is ex excruciating it's, you only have 25 years of ops we, to we like substantiate, <laughs> you know, your graduation process. Yeah. I'll also throw out, I absolutely hate the numbered unknowns for anything that has to be briefed to the senior decision makers. Um, I know you do. I know you do. And, and, I, and it's, it's being looked at. It's just, there's, there's a, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole ecosystem of concerns that come out of one change like that. Like you'll, you'll break 90, 90 things. <laughs> Not the other things. <laughs> Power I respect it, but you're breaking all our things as a result. I mean, of I agree. I can't remember numbers for shit. It's like a it literally like a strange problem of mine. Like I, I'm incapable of it. <laughs> you using random an, stuff like Microsoft. I am an artist. Okay, yeah. I need to be able to choose some fanciful <laughs> set of words here. Uh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. APT hey. purple. Speaking of terrible naming conventions, uh, and this is a, a pretty shoddy transition to uh, this week's Kandiru Madness, which I, I hope that we oh, will get to address. Oh, and that's the time before. that we have for today, so ah, thank you very much. For <laughs> come on, Sour Gum and Devil's Tongue, and those are the names that come to mind immediately. Oh, but, I, you love, know, I love that name. Devil's, Devil's Tongue is good. That sounds I mean, like some cool. folksy... Some folks Dude, I paid extra for a devil's the, tongue. The, <laughs> the problem with the problem with Microsoft is if they choose a one word name, then when I'm Googling, you have to add like a bunch of other stuff to it. If it was just devil's tongue, that would pop right to the top. Does that make any sense to that? I don't oh. understand why they don't get this. No, all I know is that I has their naming convention and you can never find their malware at all. They're like, this is called fast call. And you're like, there, there's no reference publicly to anything. Yeah, John. <laughs> so I don't even mind if there's not public reference as long as those reference in published or circulated finished intelligence reporting from those folks. It's when you don't have either that I start getting into really a moment. Yeah. So the thing with Kandiru that I that I wanted to kind of emphasize, I mean, we're in a really interesting situation. Um, obviously, a lot of folks have been working really, really hard behind the scenes going against like NSO and Kandiru over the past couple of years, probably three years or so. Um, and it's really interesting to see the fruits of those labors become public. Uh, so I really want to like emphasize it for the sake of, I think, second and third order conversations that should that we should be having on top of those discoveries. Um, you know, there's there's the technical side of it. There's, you know, we want to sit around and talk about how great the malware is and this exploit and whatever. Uh, but it it really buries the lead on what's happening with this private sector, semi-mercenary, you know, tooling industry um, that is obviously out of control. It's been obviously out of control. And, mm. and I'm not saying that we need to, you know, find some way to straitjacket it, but let's have a conversation about how it's going off the rails and has been going off the rails for the past, you know, three, four it? years. Absolutely. Uh, if if there's one bad actor out of twenty, is like the entire industry going off the rails? No, because we don't know what the hell's happening in the rest of that industry, right? But if if we're gonna talk about like everything that we have seen with NSO so far, now expanded by what we're seeing with with um, with Kandiru, it's mostly uh, activists, NGOs, and you know the the general lawlessness that we expect from the more money than sense, you know, gold plated zero day cadre, <laughs> right? And when you're talking about an industry yeah. that serves those interests almost exclusively, I feel like we need, you know, that industry that those companies need to inherit some of that concern, right? So there are a lot of state focused yeah. operations and a lot of um, traditional intelligence missions that are being executed via these capabilities. They just aren't the ones that wind up in the detection set from the frankly abusive behavior of certain of those customers uh, for those access as a service operations and uh, those contracting capabilities. Um, there's also, there are strong negative incentives though. Um, one of the reasons we see these lovely uh, ODAs being uh, sold into or being used by these uh, different firms is there's an entire ecosystem for which they were uh, very strong and very uh, reliable buyers for quite some time. Um, as operations became public in which the end users for 
the contracted access to service firms capabilities were uh, burned. And when those human rights violations were noticed, a lot of those suppliers ceased doing business with the intermediate access to service firms. Um, that ethical lapse had an immediate impact on their operations. And that's not trivial. Um, there's some other things that come along with that though. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this is because everyone wants to buy these capabilities. If you're a state service, you need a capability like this. They're hard to grow, they are complex, they involve hiring weird people. Um, your more senior partners are not necessarily sharing the things that would make you a better, stronger, reliable and responsible set of players in this ecosystem. You're responding to decision maker pressures in authoritarian regimes that are not the same uh, considerations we have in Western democratic societies under responsible oversight, um, under democratic oversight. Um, this, this creates a really difficult problem. It isn't just about the firms in question. It's not about the capabilities themselves. It's about what it means to have a lot of new players in this space acting in ways we've never seen states act before. Um, and unfortunately, or perhaps ways we've seen states act before, but it was limited to folks like the New York Times that had to adjust all of their operations to deal with state pressures in a country, in the physical world. And we were doing it for so long, we forgot what it meant to make those decisions initially. All right, so this is actually an absolutely fascinating conversation that kicked off. And I would love to continue it. Unfortunately, uh, our hour is up. And so we're going to have to sign off. So thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks to everyone that posted questions and has posted um, questions and recommendations to us privately over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with a, another discussion. And um, oh yeah, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell. Can and, we please you know, get favorite. Runa back in here? We like basically <laughs> yeah. railroaded her with the appearance of John Holquist, and we definitely have a lot to cover there. Uh, so if we're doing this again in two weeks, I I, I ask that you yeah, know, Runa, please, please come back. back. Please and do, John. You're always welcome. John, stay the fuck away. <laughs> <laughs>